Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Rogue Wave podcast, the frequency for all things pop culture and the disruptors behind it. We talk comics, movies, TV, pop culture, and the rogues who create it every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern on YouTube.com slash Rogue Matter and streaming live on Facebook.com slash Rogue Matter Podcasts. I am your host, Michael Dolce, joined as always by my cohort in crime, the lord of the radio himself, Mr. Hassan Godwin. How you doing, sir? Yeah, yes. And stuff. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. So we got a. But you know, yeah, yes. Bad. Oh, ne- yeah, yes. Us. I thought it was like yeah. some sort of like extended, like yes. But, oh, wow. but kind of like sp- spoken in a, in a weird, different wow. way. Wow. Okay. Um, well, no. <laughs> Last time I'll ever do that. Let's just say that. <laughs> no more yay us. Bad, boo us. Boo. Boo, Boo us, you and I. indeed. Um, yeah. we've, we've got a lot of Worst really indeed. cool things going on, by the way. Um, Happy Thanksgiving. Yes. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving as well to you. Uh, this is definitely the biggest bar night of the year. That's one of the things that is uh, is a tradition. Yeah, be, that would be your go-to. That would be the first thing you start talking about. Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah. Well, no, it's the Wednesday. It's the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Like, that's – it just – that's – that's the night people go out. Uh, I don't know if it'll be affected a little differently this year, um, you know, post COVID. But uh, you know, if you're out there, be safe. Uber, call a cab. Indeed. Backpack, you know, dog, Uber doggy, and you know, call uh, a cab. Do it. Do you know, just uh, you know, be smart and be safe out there. Uh, we are old, so we will not be going out unless I want to. Who do you like, mean we? <laughs> are you going out and we don't know it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah i am i am out and about man all right I am, not, well, that's, I am not staying put that's what i like to sure. hear i like to see i like to hear you being uh out and about doing doing a lot of cool things all right we've got a tremendous <laughs> show tonight though uh so much to talk about uh we've got mm. one of the actors from the new bruce willis movie michael devore is on coming on later today nice guy good guy yeah right totally here. good guy and uh yeah. got to act alongside uh, alongside uh i i dare i say bruce willis movie legend right yeah yes so. bruce willis and and patrick muldoon and patrick so, yeah. muldoon right and, and yeah. he just gets a he's a throw in at that point <laughs> you yeah know? yes so i feel kind of bad you know because you know it's <laughs> shouldn't be a throw in but you know, I guess Patrick Muldoon, you mean you're talking right. About exactly. That. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Just making sure we've got the uh, the review of the Netflix show that I kept begging you to watch. And I kept telling you, we got to do it. We got to talk about it. Yeah. So lies. now you get to rogue rage. You, you're a man who loves his lies. That's for sure. <laughs> I do All love right? my lies. It's what yeah, keeps yeah, me up. Yes. It's what, yes, you do. It's what yes, keeps me waking do. up every morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure gonna, it does. We're going to talk. No doubts. We're going to talk arcane. Uh, mm. A little bit of rogue rage on that because they just dropped the final chapter. We get to, you know, we're having a new rule on the show. We're going to start talking about things uh, when it's in its entirety. So it's been out and, and about, which is actually also a lie because we're going to talk about the first three episodes of Hawkeye next week. Um, but but again, yeah, we're, it's just we're just covering up for your for your mishaps. That's all. That's we're gonna, what we're doing. That's why whenever there's a new rule, we're just making up for something that you screwed up on. I think that's, that's fair. I think yeah, that's, I, think I know that's it's totally fair. fair and acceptable. Sounds right so. to me. Sounds exactly right to me. Oh yeah! But, all right. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, sounds sound perfect. Sounds exactly right. All right, all right. I, I I like it. I like I like the agreeing tonight, man. This is this is this is what it's all. Well, about. I mean, I'm agreeing with you, agreeing with me that the screw up is yours. Okay. Now I mentioned um, we're going to be discussing Hawkeye next week because I know. First of all, we live stream this thing out on Wednesdays, and I got to make a complaint to Disney. Don't put things out uh, on Wednesday. Put it on Tuesday. So it gives our audience a chance to have Technically, it, it is out Tuesday night or before dawn on, on Wednesday. Yeah. So, I mean, you know. Are you awake? It, just, it all depends on what your perspective is. There have been times I have been awake, but wow. usually not. Wrong side of the sun? <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, no. Um, the wrong side of the sun is being in the sun, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, however... Uh, that is the wrong side of the nighttime. Oh for yeah, me, you know. So yeah. no, absolutely. You, there, you, there, you don't want to be there. No, um, and I've I've done my best not to be. So we're gonna we're gonna dive into Hawkeye next week. We don't need you know, watch it, digest it, um, and we're gonna start instead today with a movie. I think you and I were both extremely excited 
to go to the theaters for, uh, to finally consume. It got pushed back like many, many movies before. Um, so, but it's Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters is finally here. Ghostbusters Afterlife is here. Uh, mm. We get to finally dive into what what I would say chronologically would be the third Ghostbusters movie within that canon because the Ghostbusters reboot was a was exactly that as a reboot, so it's outside of the yeah, canon this of the is, original this Ghostbusters. This is technically the third Ghostbusters movie. Right. Technically, yes. Uh, directed by Jason Reitman, son of Ivan yes. Reitman, who directed the first film. Um, and he co-wrote the film as well, too. And we get to kind of finally, you know, answer the question of, is there an afterlife for the Ghostbusters franchise? And it starts It starts with this. So do you want to go first? Here. Do you want to go first with your reaction on the film, or should I go f- first with mine? No, no, no. Let's hear what you have to say about it. Let's. Uh, you went to see it. When did you go see it? I saw Tuesday. You saw it Tuesday. I Which, by the way, I got to tell you, my Stubbs, that, my Stubbs uh, membership used to give me discounts on Tuesdays, which is why I specifically picked Tuesday this week. Stop making this about you. We're talking about the film, sir. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm telling now you about you're my film it, experience. You're, yeah, but you're about to whine about like my film experience is I paid full price on a Tuesday, and I don't know why I, I, I was. That's you know. but that's you, man. The kids, the kids don't want to hear about inflation. The kids want to hear about the film. Talk about the film. Talk about the film. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to use a sports analogy for it. Right, because mm. I love I love I, this show is yes, for anybody you who love the sports analogy. Well, for anybody the, who's late to the program, uh, this show is sports radio for nerds. That's the, that's how I always ran, fashioned the it. The rando sports analogy. <laughs> it is no no. Well, it, it is sports radio for nerds, and mm. um, so I, I'm always happy to talk and, and use analogies to describe my reactions. So. This film, if it was a if it was like a football game and you were rooting for the team to win, like it was your home team, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't a perfect game, but they managed to pull out the W at the end. Now, be careful, spoilers. We are going to spoil this. Um, this is a movie that I don't I don't know how we talk about it and not spoil it in some sense because of just how epic the end of the film was, at least from my perspective. I don't know how I can talk about this without giving away enough that yeah, that that the surprise of the end might might you know elude people who are trying to not learn that. But uh, you're waffling. Well, it's just come on, just 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 say it. Just go. I'm saying go. It, I'm going to do go. my best, but I don't. But I'm I warning know. people but, right now. I'm but just start warning doing. people. That's all. I know. But they don't need a warning. Start doing. They've been they've been with the show long enough. Do, right. do. So this is this is the way I look at it. I, I at first the opening sequence where we clearly see Egon, even though obviously the, the actor who played him, uh, Harold Ramis, has uh, Ramis had passed away many, many years ago. And so having him there would have been very difficult to do. Uh, but they do a nice job. They moldered they moldered it really well, and but what I mean by that is there was a season of X Files. If anybody was a big X Files fan, where David Duchovny decided he did not want to too much insight. We get it. You did. They did a good job of making a, a person who's no longer alive alive again. We, yes. We'll call that from now on. We'll call that the Carrie Fisher. Uh, no, I, I like the moldered version. No, yeah, they did it better in Carrie with Carrie Fisher. Mulder wasn't dead. No, Mulder wasn't It's a dead. bad analogy. It's a very uh, bad analogy. It's not an apples to apples. I will give you that. It's not an apples to apples very bad. analogy. But, however, Carrie Fisher was not in The Rise of Skywalker, yet she seemed like she was in The Rise of Skywalker. See? That is more apt analogy but for people it's, who it's are trying to figure things out. it's not because they use previous footage. So in this particular case, what they did was they actually had a stand-in actor playing Egon. So you would see him, and you would know it's Egon, but you know, again, doesn't say anything. Just kind of looks like him. They used a stand-in for Carrie Fisher a couple of times for her to, you know, get up on the bed or to, you know, to to hand things over to other people, stuff like that. You're taking this way too far. Anyway, all right. The, the bottom line is they had you liked, Egon. Uh, you, you liked how they incorporated Egon. Into I loved it. I loved the beginning. I thought, wow, this is really exciting and interesting. Um, throughout much of the film, however. I felt it was very clunky. I'm watching this, uh, you know, so Egon's grandkids come over and uh, they inherit Egon's farm. They show up. Uh, first thing I first thing that got caught caught me a little off guard was that Annie Potts 
was not the mother of the kids. Uh, I, they, they never really the, the chronology, the timeline of Egon in 1984 and in 1989, he did not have kids either in 1989, uh, is a little off for me. So I'm kind of like wondering, well, how exactly, like, who's the mom? Like, how did he end up having kids? And then I know it's not really the most essential. Yeah, you're point, getting way caught up into the No, uh, but it's minutia. something that I kind of thought to myself because they alluded to Egon and Annie Potts having, um, you know, some sort of, you know, potential, you know, relationship. So... For, I originally thought in the trailer. Yeah, but I mean, in the second one, she was after she was after uh, uh, Rick Moranis. So I mean, you know. Oh, that's they, good they, point. She yeah, moved on. they all that's moved good on. Point. Got to got to keep up with the canon, man. That's gotta good point. Got to keep up with the canon. Yeah. All right. So in some in some at some point in post 1989, Egon got married, had a daughter. Uh, that daughter ended up having a terrible life because Egon abandoned them. It was a good setup, but then again, very clunky throughout. They were trying to introduce stuff in a way where if I had known about the Ghostbusters canon, I don't know how uh, easily I would have comprehended it. And to the point where some of the characters to me, um, sometimes they come off a little too smart. Sometimes they come off a little too quippy, which again is is one of those things that we just can't seem to Either. elude ourselves. Either. From. These are nitty picks right there. I mean, like in general, like okay, so. You but know, this is like, what I'm feeling. That, wouldn't, this is how I'm wouldn't feeling. Would you say that about any story like that that has a you know like a piece of dialogue that didn't work here or you know? A no, it was an, a it wasn't just a piece of dialogue. It was there. it was the overall like that open like again. I love the opening sequence. A lot of stuff that filled in the middle of it though was just very clunky. Very like, huh? Mm, I mean, yeah, but I mean, uh, you're gonna have to define clunky. That's that's like, you know, that's not like a technical term. What do you mean? It's clun it's clunky. That's not a technical term. Like choppy. people, it. I mean, choppy how though? Well, it's choppy in the sense that again, some of the characters didn't quite click. Um, th some of the dialogue didn't quite land. There was a part in it when we were starting to reveal. You know who the who, who the bad guy was going to be, or who the bad ghost was going to the big bad. You know, for lack of a better term, was going to be, where I almost got a little Crystal Skull vibe to it, in the sense that it just really wasn't thought. It wasn't really explained to the point where I'm like, wow, this is this is some Crystal dire... Skull vibe is a bad thing. Yes. I, I, I imagine right because yes. you're speaking. My, my in biggest meta complaint now. about Crystal Skull, and not to get off too far of a tangent, was that the mystery aspect to it. Uh, wasn't very fleshed out very well, so I had no, I had no stake in him finding those crystal skulls because I didn't care about the crystal skull as a as a mysterious artifact. Um, it was it's kind of ambiguous as to what would happen if they got to it. Whereas you know, with the Ark of the Covenant or the Holy Grail or even the Shankara stones, which which is not a religious based item necessarily, I felt like they did a really nice job of you know kind of explaining the importance of the artifact. In this. Just to use that kind of as a as a an analogy, I didn't find that you know it wasn't until they kind of bring back the Gozer um, uh, was Evo Shandor where I'm kind of like oh okay that that connects and that kind of like hits a dot. But at the same time, if you hadn't seen the first Ghostbusters, I, I, I don't know how I'd feel about it. I don't think they adequately explain stuff. So like I said, very clunky. In the way they rolled yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, I get that, but you're uh, like, you know, like, are you analyzing it as a movie for someone who who watched it who has never seen a, mo that, a Ghostbusters movie? I'm or just taking you for a ride. Are you analyzing the, it? I'm just taking you for a ride on the uh, Mike Dolce train of emotions as I was watch watching this film. Well, I mean, yeah, but I mean, like, I'm just, I keep trying to get down to the to, to the bottom of how you felt about it. You're giving me, like, a bunch of, you know, mumbo jumbo about. About if you had never seen Ghostbusters before, I mean, but it, it, it's irrelevant in your case because, like, you you have seen it, right? So, yeah, like, but the, I do try to think about to the, it as uh, as yeah, storytelling, I mean, as just right. you know, as as how how this is in terms of so that's so then these these concerns are unique to you. Then these are not flaws in the story; these are unique to yourself. Then, of course, yes, in general. Yeah. Okay, I got, I got you. Yeah. But this is this is the roller coaster I'm going on as I'm watching this. As I know, but you're taking a while to do it. I don't know. You asked me a question. I'm going to give you a thorough answer. I know. You do realize. Long, you do realize. You, <laughs> you're not in the. You're not in the uh, abrupt, short uh, replies yourself department. You realize that too, right? 
I know, and you, you always let me know, so I'm letting okay. you know. As oh, you good. Know. All right. Well, that's you know, good. You know, in general. Let me know. That's good. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm here to try to let you know when you, you're not doing like a great job being brief. You know. So also, so by the end of it, just to be brief. <laughs> too late. The <laughs> Way too late. It, the end of it, though, it all did come together nicely. Um, there was a big complaint that I read on the internet about the fan service uh, in the reunion that that takes place toward the end. Uh, but I dare anybody who loved the first Ghostbusters, which is, again, I think for so many of us who grew up in the 80s and 90s, uh, just a fixture in our movie-going experience, to not shed a tear um, when all four Ghostbusters reunite at the end. What I did love also, and I was saying, and, and I said this to myself as well too, uh, my dad couldn't make the movie. Usually I go with my dad. Couldn't make it. It's Thanksgiving week. He had to help, you know, help mom, you know, cooking, which I don't, I don't know how Superfluous. that. Superfluous. I don't know Get how that happened this week, but you know, Get back on to it. make it there. Don't cut me Get off. Back on it. He's, 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 this is this <laughs> I'm is. I'm keeping this you is, on track, man. Stuff I'm that people want to know about. No, they don't. They don't. They don't care about your turkey. They don't. They care if my dad <laughs> cares. not. I went by myself, so I'm literally thinking this to myself at this point. I said, you know, even if we do get the reunion. The way to handle a proper handoff is to make sure that the characters you introduced are integral in saving the day, and they managed to do that as well, where both Finn Wolfhard um, and uh, I think it's was it McKenna McKenna Grace is the uh, is the actress who plays Phoebe, who was outstanding by the way. She was outstanding through the whole uh, film. She manages to save the day. Finn Wolfhard manages to save the day. Uh, the mom, you know, ends up, sa you know, contributing and saving the day and reconnecting. It it was just, it was one of those things where, wow, they, you know, bad game all around, got it together in the fourth quarter, won the game. Wow. Okay. Won the game. I say good movie. I say heart for heart warming. I say not end game, but it doesn't have to be. I don't like to compliment sandwich something. Whereas I say, I really liked it. It wasn't Star Wars, but I liked it. Like, no. If you like it, you like it. If you didn't like it, you didn't like it. That's all. It's real simple. Really simple. Yeah, so this is, this is what I would sit there and tell you. The ending um, made me very emotional, only regardless of whether or not I saw the first film, I think it... it, it um, what they were able to do, bringing back... Egon at the end, um, you know, made for something that was, um, I, I don't know, just it, it really, it really hit. Like, I, I definitely got emotional in the theater uh, watching it. So, you know, and I think what, what they matters. managed to do is what the initial 2016 Ghostbusters didn't do, which was to reboot, but... I mean, not only did they acknowledge the past, I mean, they significantly acknowledged the past. Um, you yeah, know, as they, I said previously, they, I think they, they managed respected it, you know, they managed to do it without destroying the uh, the other two movies, without damaging the other two movies. Yep. Which is really cool. Yep. And that's or the cartoon. Yes. Is important. Well, that's the thing. I mean, part that's, of canon. Part that's of canon. what they were able to kind of accomplish with this film. Uh, I liked all the little. Um, Easter eggs kind of thrown in there. I love the fact that in the temple, Egon had built a what essentially was a crossing of the streams in the temple to keep yeah. Gozer at bay. I mean, there was little things that just made a lot of sense when they yeah, did and that's it. the thing. Like um, some of those situations where you watch and you're like. I figured it out right away. It's like, oh, all right. That's yeah. what he set that up, you know, and that all oh, the entire farm is a big trap. You know, he set that up. That's why it didn't work in the very beginning. And mm -hmm. then, you know, that he ended up, you know, unfortunately passing away. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, I, like I said, I liked it. I thought it was a solid film. I'll compliment sandwich it for you because that's what the internet loves to do. Yeah. It was not Shakespeare, but it was a good film. Yeah. So, that's all that matters. No, I'm me. with you as well. All right, what do you guys think? I know we got a lot of cool chats going on in the Facebook chat before we had to shut it down and bring it back up again. Um, what yeah, did you guys think? Home. I know Alicia Davis was 
you know, she was in tears. She was crying. She liked the. Yeah, that's a, that was that was well done. It was really well done. I think it was great that they didn't try to do a little comedy routine mm -hmm. with it. They let it, they let the moment rest. Mm -hmm. You know, as as a sentimental moment, they let it like be unabashedly sentimental. Yeah. And you know, without without any makeup on, mm -hmm. and then they and then they float away. I don't. If you're going to talk about clunky, I don't know about the four Harold stamp in the middle of the film because <laughs> i think i think i think that's uh you know gilding the lily a little bit i think we all knew it was for harold but yes okay yes it's fine. i i don't disagree with that um like right in the middle of the screen it's like oh my god <laughs> like i you think i don't you know think what the end harold? credit sequence was all about either um the, the bill murray one was just kind of funny and it was nice to get sigourney weaver back in i'm not talking about that one i'm talking about the uh, Ernie Hudson one at the end. Yeah, I think it's just just establishing that he was, you know, that he's the one who bought the firehouse, mm -hmm. and that he's just going to fix it up. He brought the the Ecto one back, and in the next movie, Finn Wolford and uh, McKenna, uh, what's her name, is going to they're all going to move to New York and be the 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 premier Ghostbusters. I suppose I don't know. Here's the thing, though, right? I mean, Ray Stan said it. They turned into a Starbucks. Clearly, they did not turn into a Starbucks. Yeah, um, but I mean, he maybe he was being sarcastic. Maybe um, it, it's little things like that. The chronology again. The chronology of of you know when Egon actually had. I mean, she must have had. She must have had those kids like really super young. Cause she, you know, you know, just little things like that. That it's been thirty years. So I mean, you, you to to in, to acknowledge that she was probably in her late thirties to maybe, you know, maybe well, she couldn't. On the that's edge my of... point. She couldn't be. Um, she couldn't be, be late 30. She had to be 30, essentially. Because, again, if we're going by the canon in, in the second Ghostbusters, he hadn't had kids at that point. He hadn't even met anybody at that point in 1989. So you figure she's born 91. So she had to be technically like 32, 30 even. Okay. Well, is that a problem? Uh, just saying. It's, uh, you know, it's a question of when all this stuff kind of went down. Um, I hope it all adds up. I don't think it quite add it all up but you know that's only you put it. i mean he could have he could have gotten to a relationship and had a kid two months yeah after after 1984 you know and yeah. then that puts all your concerns to rest right there mm -hmm. so oh. then what's the problem he, and they could have been divorced yes by the time the 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 second movie came out 1988 lisha davis says we well, didn't have kids that we know of i think i don't quite i don't quite fashion the spangler man uh <laughs> well all right i mean nitpick it to death. it's fine anyway <laughs> i mean like is this really a thing that's sticking in your craw there were little things that... yeah no of course i'm gonna i'm gonna think about these kind of things i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah, put well, you, you, we don't need to know right. we don't need to know about them though. when we come back we're gonna dive into the netflix hit uh arcane but we're gonna do it as a rogue rage because this and this one's a positive rage when we come back. <laughs> Welcome back to the Rogue Wave podcast. Uh, we like to give Hassan a segment every once in a while, and it is all... Wait, wait, who's we? Do we like to... Is You know, okay. Well, I like to give you a segment because I feel... We. You know, right, so then you're referring to yourself as we. <laughs> well, we as a group. <laughs> okay. We Understood. as a group love to give Hassan uh, his own segment to talk about the pop culture news shows whatever is on his mind and give it and give it to him you know give it to the audience the way he likes to deliver it basically i like to just hand this over to you and uh, and have you run rampant doing your thing we call this rogue rage and today's rogue rage is all about uh, well i mean my question from me is only going to go right to you like you finally saw arcane right yes so what did you think? Oh, I thought it was amazing. 
I really did. I thought that um, all overall right. the animation is what I, I think um, What If could only hope to be. Uh, I, I think no. um, binary choices. Everybody's always binary. It, okay. no, but it's not that. Look, it's very it, it, like, how do you not um, look at the animation and go, wow, I see kind of what they were trying to do with. No, um, I, I mean, I cannot do that. I don't, all right. That's 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 how you choose a slice into it. That's fine. I, I don't I got no problem with it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the animation was breathtaking. Um, I like the fact that when they fought. They had that little because it's obviously based on the video game League of Legends. Um, they had that little kind of hop step when they would fight. Uh, I loved the fact that the um, uh, what do you call the 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 music? You know, went with everything and really like added to it. It wasn't just a, a byproduct of having you know like, like let's put a cool soundtrack here or let's put a cool song here. It it had everything to do with the story. I mean, just so so carefully well thought out. Uh, I would put it up there with, in terms of premeditated strategy meets execution, I would put it up there with Westworld Season 1, with how good it was. <laughs> All right. Okay. That's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's high praise. That, that'll work. Yeah. You put it up there with the Westworld Season 1. Yeah. No, absolutely. So you, I mean, so you're, so you're good with it, man. It worked for you. That's yeah. basically what you're saying. Yeah, it was. Okay. Um, it was a really. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know what else to say. It was. It was definitely something. But I mean, like you know, when I told you, when I told you, like you should watch it, like mm -hmm. you kind of poo pooed it because it was animation. So you got, you know, you're down. You're kind of down on animation. Ultimately. But here's the thing: I am always willing to try something um, to see if something will. I, like, I'm not going to not. Uh, get into something just because I'm not gonna have, I'm not gonna let my predispositions toward things cloud it. If something's good, I'm gonna acknowledge. Yeah, hey, that was that was freaking good, you know. So I, I give it I give it I give it its props because it did ex it did go past my uh, my initial litmus test of you know this is animation. <laughs> okay. All right, excellent. So, you know, it convinced you that not all animation is terrible and that, you know, some animation is worth uh worth you spending your time on. Obviously, it's it, you know, they're they're there are what are them? They're nine of them, right? Hour yeah. long, you know, or or internet 35 hours. 35 to 45. Right? 35. No, 45 to 45 minutes, minutes, 44 minutes each, which is internet hours, right? If if you take if you account for no commercials, it's an hour of content, right? Yeah. So you watched all nine of them. I did. Which is, you know, let's be honest, rare. Well, that's <laughs> that not you actually, well, okay. That you actually dive into the material that we're trying to cover on the show. I would sit there and say it's rare for me to get into something to the point where I am excited to watch all the all the episodes. Streaming streaming's kill, streaming is killer because I, I'm probably – not the norm i think most people enjoy the fact that there's so much content out there because they can they can just you know pick and choose and, and get into whatever they want i don't like i i'm not a fan of that i'm i'm a fan of i like apple tv because they only come out with like two new shows a year i feel like and so it's very easy it's like okay there it is if i want to watch it i know exactly where it is what it is netflix is coming out with new stuff all the time it's it's it makes it more it makes it more difficult to get into it <laughs> So, so it's not the show's fault. It's just the fact that there are too many shows. Yeah, there's too much stuff out you. there. It's too much stuff demanding my attention. So Understood. you have to be really compelling to get me to want to continue to consume oh, your... Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I have to kind of be in the mood for whatever story you're trying to tell me, too. I mean, let's let's be honest. No, yeah, so. and that, per, that makes perfect sense. But yeah. all right, so did, you did like it. So you walked, right. you walked into it. You did appreciate it. You mm -hmm. did like it. You, you know, you, so I accept your apology. All right, excellent. So <laughs> it's, a, it, you know, uh, as you said, just the same uh, – just the same as before. Like, yeah, I think the animation is is second to none. Mm -hmm. um, I don't compare animation to animation to animation because there's so much of it. There's so many varieties of it. Sure. Um, I do. I do have a gauge for good animation versus bad animation, in my opinion. And this certainly was on top of the good 
you mm-hmm. know, on the on the top list of the of all good animation. Mm-hmm. So it was beautiful. It was wonderful to behold. A lot of the the lighting and the coloring and stuff like that's amazing. The story is pretty tight. Um, it's it's a very rudimentary story, but it's told in a very stylistic way. It makes you think the story is a little deeper than it actually is, which is fine with me, you yep. know. But I mean, when you really start to dig down the you know dig to the the core of what you're watching you realize it's really not there's there's not much to it It was just but there's a lot to be learned from how to stylistically tell a story yeah you know and a lot of people just don't know how to stylistically they they either have too much style and no substance in the story at all Mm -hmm. um because it because all of the substance has been sacrificed for the sake of style yeah or they have they're they're telling the most rudimentary story in the in the plainest way possible Mm -hmm. so it's easy for you to follow but it doesn't have any you know there's no sexiness to it you know Mm -hmm. and so this actually has a good balance of both which um which I was uh, highly appreciative. Uh, I've never played League. Of- well, no, I did. That's not. That's not true. I've played League of Legends, but um, but very briefly, and I was never really into the game. Yeah, I knew it was a League of Legends. Uh, you know, I knew it was a video game adaptation. But like you said, uh, when I saw the trailer and I saw the animation, I'm like, well, I don't care how bad it is. I'm going to watch it anyway sure. because it's just because of the animation in and of itself. And I pleasantly found that it was a very good show and i'm looking forward to next season which everyone's predicting is going to be like sometime around 2028 or something like that (laughs) so you know i mean it is what it is that's the thing i don't like about streaming is that we are getting way less content for it's taking way longer for them to give it to us and everybody's okay with it because they said because everyone's throwing a tv show at us so it is what it is overall do you think that because I, I actually feel one of the advantages to animation, and and you know here, and I'll give you I'll give you something. I don't have a bias toward like in theater animated movies. I, I I I feel like I saw the original Final Fantasy. It made me think of Final Fantasy, but it also made me think of how far we've come now with animation. It, it is or... animation, but it's it's almost like photorealism. It's three dimensional cartooning, yeah. Which is, you know, like it's they've the they sacrificed the attempt to make something look like a tangible three dimensional object in yep. a simple form with you know with photorealism, mm-hmm. and they've and they've uh, um, they've t- they've tacked on the skins of actual artistry, yep, onto it. So you get near perfect um, uh, renditions of each character over yes. and over again. Yes. Um, so that's, but you know, that's all in the computer. There's very, very little of it that's actually there. There's a lot of secondary, like ancillary stuff, like you know, uh, smoke rings and you know, plumes of 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 you know, fire and, and bursts of stuff like that that are actually 2D animation, like hand drawn. Mm-hmm. But most of it is the most of the rest of it is 3D animation in the computer. Okay. So that's the age we're living in now, man. And I don't, I don't think. I don't think, and they would, they can, everybody can correct me. Mm-hmm. I'm fine with it. I don't think it takes many people to produce work like this. No, I don't, not from a technical standpoint. I don't think so. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, I, I think going back to my point about uh, animated movies and, and how, because we, we remember we had Jeff Gomez on one time and I basically said to him, I said, you know, I remember animated, every time we've had Jeff Gomez. Well, on. we've had him many times. We were, I think we were talking yes. about Into the Spider Verse and I said, you know, how come animated films are just the stories? unfold you know even going back to earlier segment right ghostbusters i said was clunky in the way it unfolded everything for me this was so crisp to kind of piggyback off of what you were saying how the story itself i understood it but it wasn't overly simplistic Uh, there was flash forwards and flashbacks but it wasn't overly jarring the characters had room to really develop and breathe. And I find that with good animated storytelling, let's go that way. I, I find that it's, it, I, it almost, it's almost always easier for an animated film to do that. And Jeff's answer was there's less cooks in the kitchen. Um, in this case, I, I can kind of, I could kind of see that. I could kind of see it as probably a very small group and or singular vision of how this show was supposed, like how this story was supposed to unfold, and and again, I liken it to Westworld season one because I think that's the same thing. Everything was very deliberate in how it was told. Everything was very 
calculated. Um, but at the same time, just it never felt like clunky. It never felt like it was on top of each other. It never felt rushed. It just felt very, very smooth. So, you know, as always, I'm finding these cool things to talk about, and we and I, and I bring it to you, and and uh, and now uh, you're yes, your yes. all about all about my selective. Uh, yes, your genius of of yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, great, and you can do these from now on. And tell us <laughs> every week of uh, your unparalleled, uh, you know, foresight and vision into the into the world of uh, of pop culture and animation and uh, and and movies in general. You yes. know, I'm, I look forward to it. I look forward to listening to all of it. I'm I really do. The, I'm not being sarcastic at all. I'm quite I'm the prognosticator you the... when it comes to this stuff. I'm always, <laughs> I'm very rogue. Procrastinator. If, if, just to stay on brand, I'm very rogue in, in, in how I'm able to, to, you know. I don't think you can self-label rogue, but all right. <laughs> I don't think you can self-apply rogue, but you <laughs> you do it. You go ahead and do it. I, I Look, I, it's tough being, it's tough. But, you know, Jim Days just said Mike is a genius. I, I agree with him. I agree with him. He's a, he's also got great taste because he was a backer in one of my Kickstarters. So, absolutely, he knows exactly. And, and a, and a well, then friend. that's that's and a long time friend. But I'm complimenting his taste. Right, uh, right. <laughs> so I guess that's settled. As I was saying, you know. Oh, well, we're we're done. We're done here. It, it must be true then. What's uh, one what's, other person? What's agrees the with one you? big positive rage that you would give out of everything you said? Uh, t- to try to convince somebody to watch this, you know what what's what's the one what's the one way you would you would angle it to get somebody who who might be hesitant about animation, might be hesitant about a video game adaption, you know, might be hesitant in general to to watch. You know, this. see, yeah, and you know what, I, I I acknowledge that that's necessary. That's a necessary angle. Like, if you had to, what would your elevator pitch be? I'd be like, f you, man. If you don't like it, you can go heck yourself. You know, like I don't care if you like it, but. <laughs> You know, like, like Hassan. Hey, I, what's up, man? Hey, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking for something yourself. to watch on TV. What should I watch? You should watch. A, you should turn your TV off and start reading a book. That's what you <laughs> should do, Michael. <laughs> no, but I, I just paid for Netflix. Oh, then you should get your money back. <laughs> I'm locked. I'm locked in for 30 days, no matter what. So, what's in the that one... case, I would. I recommend... heard good things about this Arcane. Is it like why Ooh. would I like Arcane? Oh, why would you like Arcane? Well, uh, you have a wife and two children. <laughs> but if you watched Arcane, you probably would be able to lock yourself in a room for a little while all by yourself and not have to deal with your wife and two children for a little while. No? No. No. <laughs> um, look. Spoken like a man who has no wife and two children. <laughs> that you know of, my friend. That's true. They call you Egon. <laughs> they call you Egon Spangler. <laughs> man of the night. I think, um, I look, good shows are kind of hard to come by. There's a lot of shows, as you said, but not all of them are good. And I would say a small percentage of them are actually good to the point where they compel you to watch each and every episode in the season, right? The 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 typical trend is that they start to peter out right around episode seven, eight, or nine, and start to you know is start to feel like they're stretching the point just to get to the last um, the last hour. So this is not one of those. This is also if you support animation, this is really good. This is expertise animation. This is this is another um, uh, this is another genre starter Mm -hmm. you know this is another this is another milestone for the genre in in and of itself and you should be part of it you should you should watch it also it's pretty darn cool if i'm telling you it's cool if i'm wasting my time to try to convince you to watch something then you you gotta know that's pretty awesome because i would usually be like no do whatever you want man i don't care i'm gonna have a sandwich do you know what else is pretty (laughs) awesome Uh, you're really bad segues i I don't agree that they're awesome it's gonna be amazing I think you think that they're good segues. There's a new Bruce Willis action movie out. Oh, all right. This is actually a business segue. Where this is he important. is playing the bad guy, and we've got one of the good guys, Michael DeVorzen, screen actor. Yes, we do. Coming up next. We're going to interview him. We're going to learn all about the new Bruce Willis film. We're also going to learn uh, – a lot about his musical background, his parents' musical background, and just whose side he's on in the speculation debate. We got all that coming up next. Sounds awesome.
Welcome back to the Rogue Wave podcast. Thrilled to be joined by actor Michael DeVorzon. Michael, how you doing? Good. You are Good. the star yeah. of the new Bruce Will or not the you're you're a co-star of the new Bruce Willis uh movie Deadlock and it's going to be in theaters in uh, next week I think December 3rd it hits. Uh how excited are you to go to the theaters and watch yourself up on the screen next to Bruce Willis? Uh, I am really pumped. Yeah, this is this is really exciting and definitely a, a milestone for me in my career as an mm -hmm. actor. You know, um, Bruce is a bona fide legend and uh, just an incredible actor who I've really enjoyed watching over the years. And, and to have an opportunity to face off against him in this in this movie uh, was a real honor. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it on the big screen. Now, do you have a theater rented out for this? Are you going to you're going to be bringing in like family members and 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 everything like that? Are you going to do Are you going to do the secret like put the hood over and just kind of sit in the back of the theater kind of thing? Yeah, the secret with the hood over is kind of more my more, more my style. <laughs> let, let me see what I'm dealing with first, and then maybe you know, I'll you know get get a room with some seats and have some friends over. Yeah, uh, I, I was thinking about doing that, but first things first, the movie comes out on my brother's birthday. Yeah. So I don't know no, I'm going nice. to be with my, my family. And so I figured we'd all watch it together. And then as far as any plans beyond that, uh, I don't know. Very cool. Now, you mentioned the word face-off. Uh, this is a traditional Bruce Willis uh, vehicle in, in it, you know, very action-oriented, um, except he's on the flip side of things right now. And he's not, uh, he is not the, the one saving the day, but he's the one causing the trouble um talk to us about the film and and just you know what people can kind of expect uh your role and 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 you know without giving too much away like you know your experience um in terms of your character on screen with bruce willis yeah i uh, you know what made this project really interesting to me beyond bruce being in it and a, and a great cast and um is that I've always thought of, and I think most people have always thought of Bruce as being the hero who always mm -hmm. saves the day. He's the badass hero. And so the fact that he was going to be playing the villain, I thought, this is interesting. This is, this is going to be different. This is going to be something unique. Um, so I would describe the movie without giving too much away as, as uh, one man's quest, destructive quest for vengeance. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that man is, is a, uh, uh, played by Bruce Willis. And, uh, and Patrick character. Muldoon is also uh, co-starring in the film as well, too. What, what did you pick up working on set with, uh, with both of those guys, uh, with, the, with their resumes as well? Yeah, I love Pat. He's a, he's a, he's a wonderful guy, just a, a beautiful guy. And I actually knew him in the mid-90s because my first job in Hollywood was on the show Melrose Place. Yeah. I worked three seasons on that show, and Pat uh, showed up for one season. And so, um, you know, I spoke to him a lot, but that was 16 years ago. So when I flew into Georgia, uh, day one on the set and I mm -hmm. saw Pat, it was very surreal, you know, to be doing a movie with him. Um, and yeah, he's, he's just a total pro. He's a really charming, really fun actor to watch. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just find that working with, with good actors, it just elevates your game. Yeah. And they bring a degree of presence to the scene that gets you grounded. Yeah. And, and it's like a, you know, it's like you're in a boxing ring. You yeah. It, it, you're in a boxing ring. It's like if, if the box, the better the boxer is, they're going to make you, you know, look, look better. So, um, so yeah, it was really fun to watch both of them work and Bruce, you know, he's just, um, he's got that just cool, cool as ice, yeah, kind of charm to him, you know, that's always been very magical. Now, your character in this film is seems to be a steadying presence, presence, a steadying presence. And um, it, it, it kind of, you know, any scene you were in was was always looking to, to kind of diffuse a situation that obviously was escalating out of control. It's a it's a it's a really cool action film in general. Um, at, talk to us about that and, and just kind of, you know, again, you're in this situation where, again, it's, it's escalating, things are kind of going out of control, um, but your character has to kind of keep everything and keep everyone kind of together. 
Yeah. So my character's name is Smith and he's the director of operations of mm -hmm. this power plant. And so basically he's, he's in charge. He runs the power plant uh, that Bruce and, and his gang take the whole place hostage. Um, so for me, it was just the way I approach a lot of things is, is I just take it scene by scene. You know, I have yeah. an idea of the arc of the story. I have an idea of the arc of my character. You know, I know the beginning, the middle and the end. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I just take it one scene at a time. And, and, um, uh, so I just tried to put myself in those circumstances responsible for all these people mm -hmm. being betrayed by the one guy who worked for me prior to him switching sides to Bruce and, um, you know, I just tried to be a real guy that was, that was in this situation and was trying to, uh, uh, prevent further damage from happening and prevent further lives from being lost. So it was very, uh, you know, the way I work, it's very, very instinctual, very intuitive. You know, I mm -hmm. do my homework and then I try to fill my feet in, into the earth and then I breathe and I try to stay present and I'm just like, let's see what happens. Let's see what comes out of me. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I was definitely in there trying to trying to talk uh, Bruce out of doing <laughs> more damage, and <laughs> he had his mind pretty set, as you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it was it was cool. I mean, to me, um, the film took me back to, a, you know, it's funny we have a lot of action movies now, but we don't have like those those eighties style. Uh, films that I feel like these, these those action films and that that's what I that's what kind of conjured up to me when I was watching this was a lot of nostalgia to me of of that of those eighties action movie genres is that is that the way you felt as well after seeing the finished product? Yeah, I think that's a good observation you made. Yeah, definitely. What was your yeah. favorite eighties action movie? Uh, or maybe it doesn't have uh, to be eighties. It could be anything, but to me, it was it, it felt eighties to me. So uh, that's why I ask. I, I mean, I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to look up uh, to get some ideas from. I mean, of of course, you know, Die Hard one and two are. Mm -hmm. I think those came out in the eighties. Oh yeah. Are I actually like With a Vengeance is my favorite Die Hard, the one where they're traipsing around New York City. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, mean, look, look, I get that look, look, look too. I put Die Hard second to Die Hard with a Vengeance. Die Hard with a Vengeance had the mugs and the gallon jars, and they had to fill the gallon jar, and they got to get five gallons at it. It's uh, a movie makes you really think. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know off the top of my head what else I would mention. I mean, uh, we we could throw out a few ideas of action movies, but um, um, now but, you're yeah, you're starring but, in the movie with him, but were you a Schwarzenegger guy or a Bruce Willis guy? That's a good. That's uh -oh. a. That's a question, question right there. <laughs> I, I love Arnie, but I'm definitely a Bruce Willis guy. All right, that's the right. That's yeah. the correct answer. Yes, yeah, that's I mean, yeah I'm definitely a Bruce. Until you star in a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, nice and then guy, the correct you know. answer changes. <laughs> Until you star in a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and then and, and then, then the, the then the answer changes. Yes, yes. Of course. So I was reading up on your background. Um, you're born in Los Angeles. Uh, what I found interesting, and um, we've we've had um, composers on before, is that you're the son of a Grammy-winning composer and an Academy Award-nominated songwriter, um, Barry Dvorzon and Jolinda Dvorzon. Um And it's interesting because I, I find that, like, you're obviously in, you grew up in the movie business in that way, um, but how much does music kind of like play a role based on what uh, your, your, your parents did and um, um, in, 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 in shaping your career and, you know, why, why go acting and maybe not follow in the footsteps, so to speak? Uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah. My dad is, I'm really, really proud of the work, some of the work that my dad has done. I mean, I, I, I thought he showed great range as a songwriter and a music composer. Um, and music is definitely in my D DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in my blood. And growing up, there was music, you know, was always being created in our house. Like, yeah. dad was always in the studio, his home studio, 
doing a score, you know, for a TV show or a movie and he would write stuff. He would bring us in and we would all listen to it as a family. So I grew up with music. I love music. I've always been on the cutting edge of, of like new music, whether it was hip hop back in the early nineties or house music, you know? Um, and so it's a great question because honestly, you know, now at this age, I've thought to myself and I've, I've, I've said, I kind of wish <laughs> I spent more time doing music because it's so, it's so in my DNA. It's mm -hmm. so second nature for me. It's so, you know, um, instinctually, but, uh, like a lot of young, young, you know, youngsters that are rebels, I had to do music when I was a kid ah. and I did not like the idea of <laughs> what to do. So I grew up playing piano. I had Beethoven, a statue on my com uh -oh. on the piano. I would play Moonlight Sonata. I was good, you know, and I played guitar. But I didn't like that I had to do it. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. a bit of a rebel, a bit of a wild kid. So as soon as it wasn't like as soon as I turned 18, it was like as soon as I had enough where I just said, I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. Um, I just said, I don't want to do music anymore. And I ran so, off to go skateboarding and, and go surfing. So, you know, <laughs> you learn, you learn as you go. Yeah. That's, uh, that's amazing too. Cause music is generally like what you would be a rogue for. You would, you would go toward music, you know, and then you'd have the parents being like, no, get, become an accountant, <laughs> you know, do something exactly. safe, get a safe job. Exactly. Yeah. No running to any, any, anything in the entertainment business, the parents, no. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, my dad has always said, I, I, you know, he's always been extremely supportive of all of us. Me and my three brothers are, um, you know, all do stuff artistically, but, mm -hmm. but he, you know, it would not be his first choice. Amazing. Now, um, being exposed to the movie business, is that what inspired you to become an actor? It's not, but growing up, oh. um, Kirk Douglas was at the house, Michael Douglas, um, Sylvester Stallone, so many actors and, and people in the film business were coming and going. And I was just a young kid. I didn't know. I mean, you know, yeah. I'm eight years old and Rocky walks in the house. All I know <laughs> is he's not Sylvester Stallone. He's Rocky. Yeah. I'm saying, this can't be that this man is standing here, you know? So um, that was all, you know, going on, but you know, you're a young kid, you know, young yeah. kids were just, I don't, I don't know the difference, you know, yep. I mean, uh, I'm just kind of doing my own thing. And, and uh, I think what made me want to become an actor wasn't growing up in the entertainment business. It wasn't being around uh, people that were, you know, in the entertainment business. It was mm -hmm. watching movies as a young kid. And those okay. movies in particular were the old Pink Panther movie starring Peter. Oh, Sarah. wow. Yeah. So those movies, okay. I was obsessed with them. I would, I would learn the scenes. I mm -hmm. would, you know, recreate them and stuff like that and what i saw peter sellers do on screen that's when the dream was born i thought god i would love to do that one day oh that's awesome all right those very are, cool those are no small scenes though <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's some shoes to want to step into that's pretty awesome so Absolutely. going through some of your um uh you know some of some of the your um filmographies uh, the, the one series that popped out at me, too, was you were on an episode of Charmed. Charmed is obviously right in our wheelhouse. We do a lot of comic book, pop culture, TV stuff. So Charmed is, is – talk to us about that experience uh, of being on that show and, um, you, know, uh, you know, your role in it and, and, uh, and just, you know, what your, what your take was from that show. Um, I played a vampire uh – in charm, go figure. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, I had I had much sharp, sharper fangs back then. Um, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> no, I admit it's good casting for me uh, uh, to play a vampire. But uh, no, that was that was just a, another great opportunity. Yeah, I I worked really hard on that role, and and um, uh, it was a small role but I wanted to do something really creative with it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I remember going through the audition process and uh, I worked really hard on it and it, and it was, uh, it, and it was great. It was cool. I'm, um, 
very professional, you know, everybody on set and the other actors that I mm-hmm. worked with. And, um, yeah, I was, I was very happy with, with that role. So not, uh, not talking about deadlock because it's the, it's your latest feature. Um, Pick the one role that stands out to you as your personal favorite or the one that you think you personally really knocked out of the park. Um, I had, let's see, I had three movies come out during the pandemic. But mm-hmm. two, uh, two of them, one is Her Deadly Groom and the other one was Fast and Fierce Death Race. Fast and Fierce Death Race I did with DMX. I was the lead of that one. And then uh, Her Deadly Groom was a thriller where I played the male lead, who was a kind of a romantic, charming leading man who's really a psychopath. Um, I I was very happy with the work I did in both of those Mm -hmm. roles. You know, they were very different. Yeah. Um, uh, But I think, I, I suppose if I was to choose one, because it was getting more into the intricate details of the character would be mm-hmm. the, her deadly groom. Okay. Because, because I had to be, uh, you know, I had to be this romantic, nice leading man. And then I also had to be this venomous, violent psychopath who's killing people. <laughs> and, and that can be, you know, and that can be a tricky thing to approach a character like that you know, without overacting or being too crazy. So I really worked on that role a lot to create nice, subtle moments um, mm-hmm. and not overplay uh, those scenes where he was really evil. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty proud of the work I, I did on that. And I, I got a lot of great feedback. And, and, and Fast and Fierce Death Race, too, is a very different character. He's very stoic. He's mm-hmm. a hero. Um, and uh that yeah i mean that that felt pretty comfortable playing playing that that role not that i think of myself that way i'm just saying <laughs> well you're that, out there racing uh, cars we know it. You're, you're doing you're doing death races all the time obviously <laughs> yeah my life is a death race i mean you have no idea as soon as i get off this thing i mean i'm gonna be a death race outside my place yeah Hassan drives a moped. Go figure. I don't know. Um, just, just right out there. I mean, I know. I know. I heard he's on his way over on his moped. We're going to have a death race. Have a death race man. It won't be much of a race for me. I'll, I'll watch how fast you move, and I'll be like, that's impressive. <laughs> that's the extent of it. Do you, do, you, um, do, you prefer, do you have a preference of movies? Like you've, It seems like you've run the gamut um, from drama uh, to, you know, to action movies. Do you prefer action movies? to to drama or you know like as in uh uh charm like a fantasy what would you call that like a f- the the fantasy, yeah, fantasy action um and then uh, uh deadlock is is definitely like a pretty standard you know like beat up the bad guy shoot him up action movie what's your favorite wheelhouse for uh to, you know for for these uh the various films that you do do you have a favorite genre um i don't i mean i i i i suppose it's the same whether i'm a, as a viewer i like to watch everything and i really admire everything from comedy to sci-fi to fantasy to drama to a love story i just love love great films uh, and as an actor um you know, I'm really open to to doing whatever comes comes my way. I I, w- I would like to do some comedy at some point because mm-hmm. I haven't had as much of an opportunity to do that much comedy, uh, and I'm a big fan of, of comedy. But um, um, you want to join the show? You could just be you just be, be the third co-host. <laughs> we'll just we'll just keep you on. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sounds all right. It, it works. It works out good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah so i don't know i mean listen i i think talking about action movies they're fun um because they're they're high energy the stakes are high there's mm-hmm. stuff happening so there's there's car chases there's they're very um, goal oriented also like you know exactly what you're saying. either either you're trying to stay alive or you're trying to accomplish something you know against some kind of clock 
Yeah. So yeah. it's pretty, you know, it, 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 everybody knows the stakes immediately. Everybody's locked in on those. Those are probably, um, action's probably easier to establish than, say, drama, you know? Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, but I can't imagine filming action is, is, uh, is as, uh, is, is, is any less uh, exhilarating than, or, or less exhilarating than doing drama. Um, so, you know, that was, that was just the basis of my question. If you had a preference, if do you, do you like running and tumbling and, and punching <laughs> people in the face? Or do you, you know, or do you like monologuing you know, that kind of situation? I, I would probably lean more towards monologuing. Yeah. I mean, I, I like both, but I, I, you know, I love to get deep yeah. into some yeah. work. So action films are going to be a little more, they're not going to necessarily, I mean, they can, but I like to go deep. So if, if the material allows me to um, kind of go deep into an emotional world, that's, that's something that I really, I really like to do. What's your um, dream cast list to co-star with uh, actor, actress, um, you know, your, your, your wish list of, I want to be in a movie with that person. Oh, too, too many, too many names to, to list, but thinking of, of female actresses that I really love, uh, Jessica Chastain, mm. I think she's one of the finest actors to ever do it. Um, yeah, I would love to do a movie with her. I think her work is about as, as raw and real as I've ever seen in my life. Um, I'd love to do a romantic comedy with Julia Roberts. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Always had a crush on Julia. Um, uh, male actors that I love. I mean, there's so many great ones. Leo, I think Leo is just doing some incredible work these yeah. days. He always has. I mean, but he's really blossomed, you know, and his work is so raw and so real. I think Michael Shannon is mm. one of the finest oh, yeah. actors I've ever seen do that craft of acting. You know, yeah. I watch yeah. him and I go, I don't know how he does what he does. He's on some other... <laughs> You know, he's on some other level. Like it's 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 so incredible to watch him work. Um, um, yeah, so there's a there's a few people. Absolutely no, very good choices. Oh, that's as well, a good too. list. Yeah, I I think that's a solid that would be a solid <laughs> wish list for sure. Um, we talked about this before on the show where Hassan and I. Uh, we get excited about different things in terms of in terms of movies and TV coming out. I love the speculation game. I love watching a show and going, gee, I wonder how it's going to end. I wonder if it's going to end this way. I wonder if it's going to end this way. Um, you know, even watching a movie trailer and going, mm, I wonder if the plot's going to be this. Hassan wants none of that. He wants no part of that. Now, are you a, are you a speculation junkie like me? Or uh, do, you, do you err more on the, you know, covering the eyes and the ears with the, you know, the face completely until you're able to experience it? Well, first of all, speaking of covering the face, I love... Uh, face masks that cover your eyes. <laughs> yeah. I walk around my neighborhood like that. Strange, but I say, no, it's okay. It's okay. But no, in all honesty, um, I err on the side of, I really don't, I want to know as little as possible mm-hmm. about something before I go in to see it. Now, if exactly. I'm in the theater and they play previews, I'm not going to close my eyes. I watch the previews because I'm, I'm interested in, uh, seeing them i'm interested in seeing the trailer how they cut it like how how does it how does it look so if it's presented in front of me i don't shy away from it but generally i don't look up trailers online mm-hmm. and i like to see a movie with as little put into my mind as possible so i can just have this kind of open canvas to watch this movie or tv show and kind of not know what's going to happen um Perfect answer. Yeah. And and clearly exactly the wrong one. So I mean, look, look, you can't you can't have a perfect guest. You know, sometimes sometimes they're gonna give the wrong answer. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. You know, sometimes it happens. Sometimes it happens. Michael, no. Uh, in all seriousness, this has been a blast to have you on. Um, we both got to screen the film, so we're really excited for you and, and really excited for uh, for the film. Uh, tell folks, um, you know, where they can see it and and uh, and where they can find you. 
Yeah, cool. Great. I really enjoyed this as well, guys. So thanks for having me. And uh, so the movie is Deadlock. It comes out in theaters and uh, everywhere, VOD, on December 3rd. Um, the movie's called Deadlock. And, uh, and I can be found on Instagram and Twitter at Michael DVZ. Awesome. Michael DeVorzen, thank you so much for joining us. When we come back, we'll put a bow on tonight's episode. Rogue Wave. Hi guys, Mike Dolce here from the Rogue Wave podcast. If you like this video, please feel free to like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. It really helps us out. Leave a comment, let us know what you'd like to see in future episodes, and tune in every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, for a brand new episode of the Rogue Wave podcast.